Great. And our next witness is Dr. Tanya Byron, who is a psychologist and broadcaster on child behaviour science and current affairs. In September 2007, uh, the Prime Minister asked Tanya to conduct an independent review looking at the risks to children from exposure to potential harmful or inappropriate material on the internet and in video games. Her review was published in March 2008. Uh, Tanya holds the post of Chancellor at Edgehill University and is also patron of the charity Prospects. Tanya. Hello. Um, this is actually reminding me quite a lot of my, um, my viva for my doctorate which means I'm going to tell you something that's private, but I'm going to tell you a secret, but I don't want you to tell anybody else, which is um, I'd just given birth to my first child when I did my PhD um, viva and um, was merrily chatting away about treating people with cocaine and amphetamine addiction to a room full of a panel of six men. And uh, my husband was wheeling my newborn little, our newborn little daughter around the university campus. She started to cry. He started to panic, so he then wheeled her past the room. For those of you who have children, and uh, you will know, and I'm going to tell you something very private, is that when you hear your newborn baby cry, you have a letdown reflex, which means the milk in your breasts will start to ooze out. And um, I was wearing a white shirt and had to end my PhD by breastfeeding my daughter with enormous breasts, which three of them couldn't take their eyes off. Anyway, uh, so there's, there's an interesting story about privacy. Now, I'm going, to sound, I'm going to sound like a really boring old fart um, here, because I, um, when I did the review for the government, I had, I, you know, I had to work with a very complicated system and be ever so strategic and political and make all sorts of recommendations, which Alleluia, Gordon Brown, overly orange powdered face sitting next to me on GMTV sofa on the 27th of March 2008, I will never forget it, his big orange ear staring at me, said to the nation, well done Dr. Byron, we're going to accept all your recommendations in full. But you know, you have to behave and you've got to, you know, you've got to be political and strategic here and you can't really say what you really think, so now I'm going to say it. Yes, technology is great, fantastic, and you know, yes, there, there are huge opportunities. It's amazing. I watch my kids do their homework. My daughter went into the Library of Congress in Washington D.C. the other day from her bedroom. It's amazing. You know, I went to Osage Library and found some stinky old book that some snotty kid had pulled the page out that I wanted. I mean, you know, everything is changing. Technology is amazing. The way my kids can play, the way they can socialise, and so on. But when we think about the notion of privacy and we think about communication and technology, I think we really, for me, it's thinking about kids. We can have these wonderful erudite discussions as, as, as adults. We can hear about what you thought about your ham sandwich, which, quite frankly, I don't really care. But if I wanted to, I'd click on and find out about your ham sandwich, and it would obviously make my day to know that what you thought about your ham sandwich. But the point is this, is what is going on for children? If we look at what's happening for children, maybe we can answer this question. Now, here's the thing. There is, you mentioned it, Matthew, there's a digital generational divide. There's a huge digital generational divide because kids are web 2.0, we are web 1.0. We mostly will email, um, and I'm talking, sorry for the woman who just winced, you're significantly younger than me, but anybody over about 35, um, you seriously are. I've had surgery, no, I haven't. Um, but... Um, most adults, most parents, if you talk to them, and definitely teachers, are Web 1.0. And therefore, that means they email and they search, but they don't know how to create content, upload or download content. They don't understand peer-to-peer -peer file sharing and so on. Most kids do. Kids are creating the most extraordinary content. It's fantastic. User-generated content sites are exciting. There is ways in which children socialize. Now, the reason kids are doing this is obviously because the technology is available, it's amazing, it's seductive, and it's, it's progressing in advancing in, in a huge way. But because fundamentally, Fundamentally, because we live in a risk-averse culture, because children now are not allowed outside to play, because the radius of play for children has reduced by 80% since 19, 1987, so if you to plot the radius around a house, it used to be here, now it's here, nobody's out on their bike and we don't see kids out on the street. Because we're so frightened that our children are going to be abducted, we, lock, we, we raise them in captivity. So our kids are raised in captivity, they're in their bedrooms. A developmental imperative of childhood is to socialise, to communicate and to take risks. So they can't do it outside in the offline world, they'll do it online. So the digital generational divide is really shocking here because children are technically savvy but they do not have the skills of critical evaluation necessary to understand what you need to do to keep yourself safe. And today we're talking about privacy and so let's think about privacy in kids. You meet a group of kids. When I, I'm here with a friend of mine and a colleague, we've known each other for many years. When we were young, we would have pyjama parties. We'd have parties with all our little girlfriends. We'd in our little pants and our little tops and our little prepubescent bodies, and we'd take photos, and then we'd show them in the playground the next day, but we'd take them back home. Now, we can post it. I can post it on my social networking page. I haven't set my privacy setting because I don't really understand it, and my mum and dad haven't talked to me about it because they don't even know what social networking is. So what I've fundamentally done is I've taken a picture of myself, a 13-year-old pubescent girl, 
girl in my knickers and bra and a load of my friends who I haven't consented to do this. I've blown it up, life size. I've stuck it on my front lawn with my name, address, telephone number and every other identifying way that you can come and get to me. And I've said, hello world, here I am. That really bothers me. That really bothers me. It's great to be able to do it. It's great to be able to do it. But when we look at the, ch the, the, the vulnerable, the vulnerable who are doing it because they don't understand the consequences, they don't know what a digital footprint is, they don't understand that when, once it's out there, it's out there forever. I'm not saying it's not great. It is great. It's fantastic. But unless children are enabled to think about it in a way that they can have help critically evaluating what they're doing. I'm worried about their privacy and I'm worried about employers checking back. I'm worried about people knowing things about them they shouldn't know. And I'm worried about the fact that one in ten children will meet somebody who they have met first online. So I think the notion of privacy, we have to, re we have to construct it in a different way for these technologies, but really for the safety of children. And there is no argument that the safety of children is paramount when we think about technology society and the way we're progressing. Amen.